Let's just begin really quickly. I am going to be speaking a little bit about writing for for mariachi sones and rancheras, especially on the violins and the trumpets. I know it's a little specific, but um, it's something that I have put down a lot of questions about. Um, and I know there's a lot of students in here that uh, maybe in the future. How many of you guys are thinking about studying music in the future? Okay, that's quite a bit. Okay, you know you're gonna have to take a lot of theory. So uh, you're gonna have to take theory, you're gonna have to take a whole bunch of stuff. So hopefully this will serve you as well. I know uh, there's a lot of your, your instructors here that write for your programs or maybe are interested in learning a little bit about that. So I'm gonna try to keep uh, as concise as possible. A lot of these concepts it might be a little difficult, but just try to stay with me and uh, I'll demonstrate what I'm talking about as much as I can. Give me one second. Thank you. <laughs> okay, so my, my play that I'm going to give today is called Writing for Violins, Trumpets, and Rancheras and Sons. And essentially, the, the, the biggest thing that we need to have is obviously a good foundation in music theory. Uh, we need to know our key signatures, major and minor scales, their diatonic chords. Uh, by diatonic chords, I mean like the, the one chord, like the word C1, C major, D minor. E minor. I know maybe some of you guys do that for warm ups. You do D e minor, F, G7, you know, one minor, major, that kind of stuff. It's essential to do that. And some people are surprised that you need to have a good foundation of the harmonia in order to write for violins and trumpets and for voices. It's completely essential. So then you have a little bit of that. Um, you need to understand the concepts of primera, segunda y tercera. Does everybody know what that means? Primera, segunda y tercera, más o menos. Harmonia players, I hope you guys do because it's really, really useful. In, in theory, we call it tonic, subdominant, and dominant. Um, the basic functions is, uh, the basic functions of those three, uh, I guess, tonalities. You need to have a good understanding of that. You need to understand how to build triads. Um, how many of you guys have taken theory before? Music theory? Yeah, that could be. It's okay. Um, it's, it's essential, guys. It would be very uh, beneficial for you guys, especially if you want to take this seriously. You might be surprised that a lot of people that you, they, you gig with and you guys do gigs outside or professional mariachi musicians, they're very, very well versed in what this uh, mariachi theory. Even if they don't call it theory, they have their ears trained for it. So, very, very important for that. Intervals, building intervals, which is distance between two notes, you have the good foundation for that. Uh, with this principle we call secondary dominance, segundas in, in different keys. It's just a whole bunch of like basic theory stuff that we need to be very familiar with. But uh, what I want to speak today is give you guys a few examples. Oh, there it is. Cool. Give you guys a few examples in writing for uh, different scenarios in the mariachi. So this whole presentation I'm going to be catering to like a performing ensemble for like schools, right? So we're talking about eight violins, ten violins. Not like a chamba group that might be one violin and two trumpets, that kind of stuff. Some of those things apply as well. But for this presentation, it's going to be writing for like what we call a, like a performing ensemble, a big big violin section, two three trumpets. And of course, don't forget that in music, practice comes before theory. So a lot of these things are prep happen and then we put names to them. And there's not one right way to do that. At least I think that's how what I believe. There's not just one right way to do things. This is what's worked for me over the years. Lots of trial and error, lots of studying scores, studying theory, and this is what happened if there's other ways to do stuff as well. So let's start with, with a little bit of the music. So the first examples that we have here uh, is writing for two voices. Now when we write for two voices, the way you gotta think about this is it's not like two violins or two trumpets. It's literally, it could be one violin, one trumpet. Ten violins, one trumpet. Usually the violins go together when, when they're like in a section and we're gonna write for two voices. It's usually all the violins playing one note with the trumpets. And that's what we have right here. So a lot of people tell me, well, how do you harmonize, right? How do you do segunda? How do you, do, how do you know which way to go? How do you do that? Um, and there are some kind of rules that we try to essentially follow and I'm gonna just pick one really quickly because that's, that's uh, if you kind of stick to these rules, you'll be right about 95% of the time. So what happens is that most of the movement that happens between the two parts, now this is a transposed chord, uh, so it's not in concert, right? So if you look at the trumpet, the first note is C sharp, but it's actually playing the concert B. Most of the movement is gonna happen in thirds or sixths. And so if you don't know intervals, you gotta get familiar with them. An interval between a B and a D is a third. 
and then they move right away. It's pretty much in thirds the entire way, except for some other places. So that's one of the rules that we have to have when running for two voices is they have to be in thirds or six. A six is the numbers of the third. You didn't know that? Now you do. It's the same in interval, but just backwards. So instead, like pretend the trumpet had a C sharp way on top, it'd be between the, the B and the D would be a six. It's the same sound, except it's just a bigger space. Okay? Um, this is gonna be happening, you're gonna stick in almost always thirds, except for a few parts where you do our pitches. So I don't know if you look at measure one, two, three, four, five. Are you dividing or general pitches? Beep, 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 blah, blah, blah. The trumpets are doing the same thing. If you look at the, uh, the lowest note, it's actually a fourth there, it's not a third, because you're just doing our pitches. That's one of the exceptions that we have right there. And um, another one of the exceptions that uh, we might have is what happens at the very, very last note. So real quick, uh, the trumpets are playing C sharp. Well, the, the one trumpet is playing C sharp, which is a concert B, and the violin is playing E. That's a fourth, that's not a third. And I just broke my own rule that I said about having thirds all the time. Well, that's that happens when the melody is in the sixth. So what happens is they have a G chord, which is the harmonia. You always have to look at the entire score. You have the harmonia, the harmonia is playing a G. So the E is the sixth of the chord, and we cannot, uh, we have to have the third on the, on the trumpets as well. So enough talking. I want to see what this sounds like. I'm going to have these wonderful students. Can we have a run for these guys here? Please. By the way, I've known these, that's how you know I'm getting old. I've known these guys since they were in high school, so in middle school. And now they're here, and this makes me so proud to uh, have them right here. So. Let's, let's listen to the first one, and then I can, I can analyze it a little bit and just for example, so that I've been talking about. So we're just going to play it, and then we're going to talk about it. So it's a ranchera bateada. Okay, and this one trumpet unison with the three violins playing together. Just because we have three violins, and we have to have three violin parts. Super important to remember that. A lot of beginner arrangers think, oh, I need to write three parts all the time. No. Writing one melody line is super cool, and it sounds really pretty. Here we go. One, two, three, one. Ready? And one, two, three, and. two parts is that you need to have the third. I wish you could, you guys, I, I have a document for you all that uh, I will pass out and hopefully if you guys are taking video or you guys are taking notes, uh, these these documents will help you because these are kind of specific rules. But just try to follow along real quick. One of the most important things that you need when you're ready for two parts, you need to have the third in the court all the time. So when we do a trial, we have the root, the third, and the fifth. One, three, five. When we have a C major, C, E, G. When we have a G, G, B, D. The most important note to have is the B. In a G chord, G, B, D. Why? Because it's the third. One is G, B is the third, D is the fifth. Why is that? Because that's what's going to define this major and minor. That's always going to be the most important thing. So, for example, in the second measure, you have a D7. The first note the trumpet has is an E, which is actually a concert D. And then we have the F sharp on the violin, which is the third, right there. But at the very beginning, I broke my own rule again. That's why I always, you guys have this document, because the rule is broken a lot of times when you have the, the trumpet. Or the, I'm sorry, the other voice doing a six, the six of the chord, which is the trumpet's playing the F sharp. I mean, the F sharp is the concert E. So I might, if I'm going too fast, guys, I'm sorry. I'm just trying to get as much information as I can. Um, and then hopefully you guys can analyze it a little bit slower. We have the F sharp, which is the concert E with the G at the top. There is no third there. I just broke my own rule. I said G, B, D, because it starts in G. G, B, D, there's no B. Well, where's the B at the beginning? Well, one of the times we can break the rule is when we have the six. Because the six makes a third with the root. The root is a G. Right under that is a is a is a E. Which is what the trumpet's doing. And then if you look at the measure over here, fifth measure, we have the arpeggios. I already mentioned that briefly, but we have the first violin, the violin is just doing arpeggios. Like that. The sec the trumpet has a C sharp and an A, which is gonna be a third exactly right, but then when it goes on to the to the E, it's actually making a fourth. Well I broke my rule again about having thirds all the time. That's because when we do arpeggios, we break these rules. So that's kind of another rule. And then at the end, once again, what I said, I don't know if you guys heard it, but it sounds a little bit different. The set, the last, last note sounds a little bit different than the rest of kind of the melody, because it's not a third, once again. The trumpets have a C sharp, 
and the, which is a concert theme, it's always on the whole step, and the violin side the E. It sounds a little bit different, because we cannot keep thirds. If we were to do a third on the trumpet, it would be a D natural, and it would sound super white. It would sound super, super weird. And we don't want that, because that's, the, that's not the third of the chord. So let's see if you guys can hear at the end. Well, let's hear it one more time, let's play one more time, and we will do, uh, listen to that very last note that between the trumpet and the violin, the sound between the two and see if you can hear how it just sounds a little bit different. Three, and one, two, three, and... So it's, there's like a weird sound at the end of the chord. It's not a third, it's a bigger space, but that is what we have because we cannot make a third with the trumpet because then it's not gonna be a chord, so it's gonna sound really good. So that is the biggest, the biggest thing when, when doing in thirds. Real quickly, before I move on, I also wanted to mention one thing before I forget. Yes. That's just a simple suspension. It's something that you study in theory. The, the, the fourth measure, the violin said E, D. It's over a G chord. You're like, well, why are you not landing on a G? It's just E, D. The, con the trumpet is going D, C sharp. The D is just a constant C, and it's suspended in the results. You're like, what's the suspension? You learn when you stay theory, it just it resolves. Original. Unresolved. It's always like it's unresolved suspension, which is resolved. Something very simple. And it's very, very, very effective. So it doesn't mean that it still has to always line up. Again, I'm just trying to throw uh, as many concepts as I can with you guys. Uh, Pancho will send you guys the outline that I have for this. And yeah, so let's go to the next example. The next example, number two, we're gonna talk about it in a song setting. So this is, this is just a little trips I wrote for the, uh, the sake of, of uh, reinforcing what we just talked about. So really quickly, we're in key of F. Key of F, F, A, C, we have to try it right there. So my rule was again, stay in thirds and you need to have the third of the chord on there. So you have to have the A at the very beginning, which is with the violin side. Let's just hear it for this here real quick and see See what it sounds like, and then we'll try to break it down a little bit. Ready? Uh, give me two minutes. If you have on the lead violin, we have an A, F, A, C, then you could have F or C. These are the two notes. The trumpet has the C, which is a D, but it's a, it's a concert C. It could also have a G, but the, the, which is a concert F, because F, A, C, but then the melody will not fit the same way. So that's that's uh, why we have it like this. And then if you notice over here, one, two, three, one, two, three, four, five, the sixth measure, uh, we have a little bit different movement. The trumpet moves different way than the, the, the trumpets. Towards the end, the, trump, the violins go up and the trumpets go down. We go from being in thirds, we go into six. That was one of the rules that we talked about in the beginning too. We want to stick in thirds or six. And as long as we're fulfilling the other rules, we can be able to move them around as much as we can. So we went from thirds to, so we started in the very beginning, we started six. And then in measure four, we go to thirds. And this doesn't sound weird because we're still doing the same rule of sticking in thirds and six. And at the end, listen to the trumpet, we're gonna hear it one more time, and then listen to the way the trumpet moves different than the violin, which is measure six of what I want to do. Here we go. One, two, three, one, two, and. There's like different movements going on. The trumpets are going up, the violins are going down, but I'm still sticking to my rules regarding the um, going in, in thirds and sixths. That is the basic concept for these things. Um, does anybody have any questions regarding what we just covered real quick? Any questions regarding these uh, writing? Please feel free because uh, there's, I, I know, once again, I know there's a lot of, there's a lot of information in this, but hopefully it could be of use to some of you students that are maybe thinking about it writing, or especially you directors that are sometimes trying to 
right for your program and, and you might have some questions. And of course, always feel free to, to talk to me about any of these things. Can we go to the next example, please? Let's go to example three. We're gonna be talking now, now we have the full three parts. A question I get a lot is, how do you do tercera? And I don't know if you guys go work or you do gigs. You're like, well, there's, this person said you tercera this way, this is weird, and then I went with somebody else and they told me to do the tercera by then the third part. They told me to do it different, but it just sounds funny. The reality is that there's not one way to do these things. There's like five different ways. And they're all right, that's what's cool about music. Music is not like a, like a perfect science. Two plus two is four. There's no third part necessarily for this that's gonna be like 100% of it. So the first one that I want to introduce, this one, is I like to think about, about this writing in structure, in constant structure. So a lot of times when we think of writing for I actually we're like, okay, we're in C. So C, E, G, we're gonna do the three notes. But like for example, if you look at the third measure on the violins, we have a B, E, G. A B is not part of the C code. Why is that there? You're thinking, well, maybe the C should be there instead of a B because you have C, E, G. Well, the reality is that the way you approach writing thirds for this is what we call, like what I like to call constant structure. That means that I'm not really messing with the actual chord as much as just kind of keeping the same movement. What's that going to do? That's going to give everybody is moving exactly the same. Right? The first, the second, and third are moving exactly the same way. I don't know if you guys, the violin players, or even trumpet players, when you're doing like third parts, sometimes the jumps are really hard to hear, they're really weird to memorize because they're like, they don't sound like a melody. And you play the third part by itself and you're like, that sounds super weird. I can't really hear it or memorize it. That's happened to me for sure. And if, if that's happened to you, it's many times because it's not written this way. Is it right? Yeah, I'm sure it's right, but it's just different ways to approach it. So this will give you a different uh, kind of sound. Let's hear it real quick, let's hear it. Um, now we have the two trumpets and the three violin parts. Here we go, two measures, ready? One, two, three, one, two. So here's, here's the, the key points, and I know some of you guys can hear it because y'all are great musicians. The third measure might be sounds a little bit weird, right? So let me hear the violins, just play the first four measures, please. Just the violins, ready? One, two, three, one, two, and. Good, thank you. That third measure sounds funny because that third part is going to a B. Can you do the same thing, Juan, but can you play a C for the third measure instead of a B? So G, G, F, G, G, A, C, C. Play. One, two, three, one, two, F. Yeah, so it's okay. So one more time, one more time. Do C, C, A, C, C, or C, C, B, C, C. It doesn't really matter. Ready? One, two, three, one, two, F. Good, cool, cool. I don't know if you guys see the difference, but it sounds really, really different with the tercera. The tercera doesn't sound as clashy. It sounds a little bit more traditional. That's the, another, if, can we go to example, uh, I think it's eight, right, or seven? That's the one that we did this with, the same thing. Five? Oh, yes, five, I'm so sorry. Yeah. Go to five, I'm sorry. So that is the, three and five are pretty much the same thing except for the tercera. That is the biggest difference between those two ways of writing. One of them is top thinking and structure. That means that, again, by structure, I mean like the shape of the chord. It's a third at the top and a fourth at the bottom. It's a space. Can you go up to the third one, please? Just even visually, you can see that the violins stay exactly the same way the entire time. If you look at the second, third to the last measure, the violins they have a, a G and E and a B. That's not a C chord either, because the, the B is supposed to be a C. But it still sounds nice because it's constant structure. This is the sound that, it's, it's a very contemporary sound. By contemporary, I mean like more like jazzy, I guess. Some of you might, that, that might be more advanced, might be like, well, that's like a major seven, because that's like a jazz chord. So it sounds, that's the way to think about it as well. That's the way I started thinking about stuff when I started, because I, I went and I studied jazz for many years. I used to think about it as a major seven. But this is a better way to think about it, constant structure. It means that we are keeping the structure exactly the same all the way through. Let's hear one more time, guys. Let's hear one more time. One, yeah, from the beginning, number three. 
Let me do it again. There you go. One, two, three, one, two, and. This is uh, what we said, uh, writing in constant structure. Because once again, just to reiterate, sometimes just keeping the harmonic structure will give you weird funny notes like that B natural. And, uh, and also, if you look at the measure that says G7, which is one, two, three, four, five, the third violin is going D, D, A, right? A is not part of the G7 chord. G7 is G, D, D, F. Why is there an A? Is what I just said, we are keeping the same structure. Let's go to number five, guys. Can we scroll down to number five, please? This is kind of like the opposite of that. Oh, in a way, it's very similar. But if you look at the notes, I closed up the gaps. If you look at measure three, four, all of a sudden we're in closed position. That means that there's no space between the third, the second, and third notes. This is what I like to call just kind of sticking stick to the, the chord tones. There's a lot, of, this is more like old school sound, very traditional sound. Um, there's a certain mariachis that have this kind of sound as opposed to some other mariachis that have kind of the other sound. And if you look at, again, that G7 chord, we have that, that third beat on the one, two, three, four, five, fifth measure. The third violin has a B instead of an A. That is because G7 has a B, not an A. So now we're prioritizing writing chord tones over the structure. And it's gonna sound, it might sound a little bit different. And the second to that last C chord, which is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, measure seven, that is also we have a C triad right there. You see how that part is right there, different. Your part, you pick a C instead of a B. So let's hear this one, see if it sounds any different than the other one. Here we go. One, two, three, one, two, and. Just the violins. Example five. One, two, three. One, two, three. Right. I don't know, but to me, it sounds way different. Maybe you guys might have something like this. It does. It's the third violin. It's really different. It sounds super, super different. Now, here's also some of you theory people. What's that thing that Bach used to hate? Or like, you know, you see those things that put parallel fits. We don't want parallel fits. Because we have taken theory, you probably have points out at some point for writing parallel fits. Look at measure three. We have straight up parallel fits, the top part and the bottom part, right? The first violin and third violin, we have that. That will give you a big old red mark on your theory test. That is another reason why I like to use the other one. To be quite honest, that's how a lot of people will voice stuff because technically it's right. Technically, you're following the chords and you're following the things. It doesn't sound weird. Like, it doesn't sound like you're breaking the law, like people say in theory. It doesn't sound super crazy. But once your ear starts getting trained to listen to it, your ears can start hearing these parallel fits. Again, it just takes a lot of time, a lot of retraining. But that is the reason why I like using the other method because it avoids that fit, parallel fits. Because when we keep the constant structure, when we keep the other one that we're doing, it's three, can you scroll down to three? One second, please. We scroll down to example number three. The top first violin and third violin are in six the entire time, and that's not breaking the law, right? So we just keep no parallel fits the entire time in measure three. And also, it gives you that other sound. It gives you a little bit more of a, uh, I guess, contemporary sound. Hope, I hope that's kind of making at least some sense, guys. I'm trying to be as, as clear as possible. But uh, let's go to number four. Still with that? I forgot what that was. Can we scroll on number four? Okay. So this is the same thing. We have this constant structure. Look at the violin part. We have all the same shape, pretty much. That's just keeping the structure. And there's going to be some weird notes. Like at the very first note, the very grace note, we're going to an A chord. Why is the third violin playing a G sharp? Was it a major seven? Maybe. But it's also just kind of the same thing, avoiding that that parallel fits. Let's see what it sounds like. Let's do let's do four. There's a song. One, two, three, one, two, and Okay, so 
Violins, let me hear the beginning. Just the violin, the first two measures. One, two, three, one, two, and. Violin, one, two, three, one, two, and. Good, very good. Okay, so that might sound a little weird to you for the tercera. Can we scroll down to six? Example six, please. So look at the very first measure. Okay, so now the third, we're doing the same thing we did with the other one. We're closing up the, the triad so that it's parallel fits. So we're breaking the log in. But it's going to be in the first two measures. And example six. One, two, three, one, two, and. Sound different? It sounds way pretty different to me. It just sounds, doesn't sound as like contemporary because it's out of major seven. It also sounds weird because we're moving the parallel fits at the top of the bottom. Here's another thing, real quick. If you scroll, can we scroll up back to four? Just as a side note, too. Can we scroll up to example four, please? Thank you. We have, those of you know harmonia, we have an eight and we're going to a D. What do we do? Does anybody know what happens usually when we're going from eight to D? The harmonia, what happens to an A chord? That's right, you make it seventh, right? You make it seventh chord. So we're gonna go, it's like we're preparing septima to go to tercera. That's all we're doing. So let's pretend for a little bit that we had a seventh chord instead of just an A chord. So we have the seventh. The seventh is gonna be a G natural. That means that Joel, oh yeah, your third part, you're the one getting on the cool stuff, right? Today. <laughs> the, the G is actually gonna be a G natural. So I'm gonna ask my harmonia and Joel to change it to an A7. So Joel, you're gonna play a G natural and I'm gonna be play A7 instead of a D. And see if you guys can hit the difference between that. This here? All you guys? One, two, three, one, two, and. <laughs> In my opinion, that sounds a little bit more uh, voicey, um, like going somewhere, and it sounds a little bit richer. Um, so now let's see if we can do example six. I know we're going back, but let's go to example six once again, guys. Now we're doing the same thing. We're closing up the triads. If you look, there's a lot of parts that we close. We're getting rid of those. That six. Is this right? Like I said, I'm not one to tell. I'm not Bach, and I don't really. Set the rules, but we have a lot of parallel fits here. Let's see what that sounds like. Maybe you guys do that. That sounds disgusting. Maybe it sounds amazing. Let's go. Six. One, two, three, one, two, and. The only biggest difference, the, really the only difference is measure two and measure four. But it's pretty obvious. And those are the things that really, the details that will help you write more in, in thoroughly for, for if you decide to write. Those things matter. They matter a lot because they're the little details that people that, are, that know this kind of stuff. And even if you don't know the theory, it does sound different. And you might not be aware of it, but your ear can tell if it's doing parallel fits or doing. These are the two biggest ways that I approach writing their setup. There's, there's obviously other ways. I was gonna try to write some other ways as well, but it's uh, these are the, probably the two that I use the most. Um, when we do arpeggios, it's the same kind of thing. We just kind of do arpeggios up and down, so it's, it's no big deal. Does anybody have any questions regarding any of these things that we cover about, about their setup? Teachers as well, please. If you have anything, I can try to answer. But if you don't, I wanna cover another little piece that I that I did. Um, the, last, the last two examples. So, Let's go to the very last thing I want to talk a little bit about is range considerations. So, range, right? It's like a trumpet um, killer word, I guess, because some of us work for range and then some of us don't have it and some of us do. And then we think we're really good and we can hit that high C. In mariachi, we do have some sort of range constraints for sones and rancheras. Not necessarily because they you can't play them, or you can or you can't play them, but also because rancheras are not going to sound good if you go too, too high, or that's just kind of like, that's the way it goes, and that's something that's taken me many years to kind of understand, a lot of times we want to write really high and really difficult, but this is what we're going to do. I changed, let's go back to number one, can we scroll back to number one, please? Number one, this is the little rancherita that I wrote, a little piece, 
And we have the violins in a very comfortable range, violin players. Uh, it should be not too difficult to play that all first position, pretty simple. Trumpets just have that G sharp, it's not too bad. So it should be pretty comfortable. But for a beginner, it might be a little bit, it might be a little bit too much. But let's, we're gonna hear this, and then we're gonna hear the voices inverted and see if you hear anything different. Obviously, it's gonna be different, but see what we get from it. Let's go, one, one, two, three, one. Ready? One, two, three, and. One, two, three, and pop. Okay. It's very clear they're both right in the center of the range. It's very, very simple. Very pretty. Just very, you can repeat it, you can kind of hear it back, and, and oh, that's, that sounds pleasant. Let's scroll down to one, two, three, four, six, seven. Let's go to example seven, please. Example seven. And I'm not going to say anything, I'm just going to let them play it, and then maybe you guys can tell me if you like this better or you don't like this better. Very good. Ready? And one, two, three, and. Okay. What's the biggest difference between that? It's just the trumpet and the violins are obviously in the lower range. I changed some of the melody a little bit. It's, it's very, very similar, but the melody that one is exactly right? So, but the other parts. Now, when do you write this and when do you write the other one? Obviously, if you have a, a group that's not too advanced, maybe you're trying to play like an eye higher than E or something like that, then go for something like this. There's no reason to do, it's very, it's perfectly acceptable to do this. But also, this has a warmer sound to it. It's a little bit less uh, piercing. Not that that's a good thing or a bad thing. What is the song talking about? Well, I don't know, I just invented it, right? But if the song is talking about like something very sweet, like a love, maybe I would write this one because it's a lot warmer. The trumpet is it's a very slow range, but it has a very round sound. Now, if you're talking about heartbreak, then I'll try to do the other one. I don't know. These are things that as an arranger, you kind of have to, it's not only just about writing the melodies. It's not only just about writing like the, all the chords that you know. It's something as simple as inverting the range can completely change the feel of everything. I like this one better, to be honest. I like the low one better. I don't know why. I like playing high trumpet too, but I like this one better. It just it just has a little a smoother sound. Let's hear it one more time. Let's hear seven, please. The violin doesn't go higher than E. The trumpet doesn't go higher than B. It's not that high. Here we go. One, two, three. So it's like in my imagination, because as arrangers we like have to be creative all the time. This sounds a lot more something like Serenata Sin Luna, something like romantic ranchera that's very passionate. But that's just, again, those are, these are just things that I've come up with and that I've, not come up with obviously, but things that I've noticed and that have helped me write a lot. Help me write for what I'm trying to convey. So let's look at the last one. Let's go back up to example number two, please. This is the little song. So now I did the opposite. We have the song, which is in a, it's in a good range. The trumpet is not very high. The violin is not too high. But then we're going to do an example where everything is higher and it's more piercing. See if you guys like it or not. Let's hear this one. Let's hear number two. And then we'll do the other one. Ready? Uh, Let's scroll down to the last example, which is example eight. And then, okay, so what do you see in the trumpet immediately? And what do you see in the violin? It's way up there, right? Trumpet, uh, you have to have a solid trumpet player that can play this. Fortunately, we've got some very good players here. And the violin is obviously too. We have, we're not going higher than third position. Um, you could, but I didn't want to make you guys work, so I just get to the third position. It's third position, but it's gonna be a lot brighter. Let's play it, let's, let's hear it play it, and then y'all tell me what you think. Here we go. One, two, three, one, two, and. Was that better or worse? That's exactly right. Nobody knows, right? That's the 
thing. That's why as an arranger, you have to see what you're looking for. For me, this has that feel of, of, of uh, like, uh, I mean, I guess all songs are very energetic, but if I was to write something like this, I would probably put in like just once in the middle of the song or at the beginning, or maybe, because, I mean, you ask your trumpet players, if I have you guys playing like this for the full three minutes, right? It's gonna, it's gonna kick your butt. It's gonna kick everybody's butt. It's not easy to play in this range. So it's just like, again, it's like adding seasoning to your, your, your whatever, your carne asada. If you dump the whole salt, it's gonna taste nasty. Yeah. If you do this whole thing, like this range, it's gonna be too much, at least in my opinion. Now, if that's what you're going for, well, all the part of you, but what are you writing for? You're writing for uh, a competition, then maybe it's a good thing. But if you're writing for like a, a, a song that somebody wants to record and, and they want to feature the voice, well, it might be good to just do it in the middle one time and then just kind of back off after after that. And all I'm doing really is just switching the voices around. You're like, well, what am, what, what's happening? I'm just switching the voices around. I'm moving some of the parts a little bit, uh, just the way they move. Again, I'm actually sticking to the same rules I was talking about at the beginning, just playing verbs and six. If you were like sit down and analyze this with the, the theory, um, the theory hat, then you would know that it's just third and six, pretty much. So let's, let's hear both of them again. Let's hear uh, eight first, and then we'll do the other one. One, two, three, one, two, and. Beautiful, beautiful. All right, yeah. And then usually when you hear a trumpet play like that, you look at them, they're like kind of purple. Because it's a lot, it's a lot of air. Let's go to the next one, uh, number two, the last one. That, uh, the scroll down to two, please. Thank you. Sure. One, two, three, one, two, and. Okay, so here's, uh, the trumpet part is moving a little bit different. It's a little bit more melodic in, in some spaces, but it's just, a, it's a different sound. So I guess my, my overall point in this, and in, in these like, brief uh, theory, exercises that, I, that I've been given is that as an arranger we have a billion and a half options and none of them, unless you like, you know, really just playing the wrong here or whatever, they're not necessarily wrong. There's many ways to do these things. It's just depends on what you're going for. Well, how do you know what you're going for? Well, you have to kind of understand your theory. You have to understand because if I ask you, I'm like just out of the blue, what should you like better, this or that one? Well, you might say, oh, I like the other one better, but why? Well, that's kind of what the job is of the arranger. And I think that uh, I think that there's been a lot more interest in this kind of stuff over the past years. When I started back in when I was your age, uh, I used to like this kind of stuff, but there was not a lot of resources. There was a few people that were kind of writing already, but there was not a lot of this kind of information. So uh, take advantage of it, really, guys. Take advantage of it. I I've been fortunate enough to help some of you guys out. I don't know if there are any, any of them are here, but I've giving some lessons to some people who are arranging and this kind of stuff. Uh, there's a lot of very good, talented musicians around here in the UTRGB area and in your schools. So if you guys find this interesting, pursue it, guys, because there's not a lot of arrangers out. There's not a lot of arrangers, and it's a beautiful art form. I guarantee you, it feels really cool whenever, like when the first time I had a group of this caliber play my music, it's, it's crazy, it's undescribable. And not having these guys play this, this is really awesome. Can we get one hand again, guys? Thank you so much, guys. And before I go, I just have to say, is there any question you guys might have, anything in particular, I'll be happy to answer, but they're about to kick me out, so I think I think we're all set. We good, Dr. G? We good? No? Yes? Gotcha? Yeah. Okay, thank you guys so much. Please uh, feel free to reach out if you guys need anything. Uh, thank you, Daniel. Thank you, Michelle. Let's give a big hand.